It's Friday, August 31st. Last day of August, folks. 2018. Welcome to Raging Chickens Out the Coop Podcast. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Each week, I talk to our capital muckraker in chief, Sean Kitchen, about the good, the bad, and the ugly in state and national politics. Today's show, rip to Senator John McCain. While the week was dominated by accolades for John McCain, let's remember we can walk and chew gum at the same time on this one, folks. Tallahassee Mayor Andrew Gillum pulled out a huge upset in the Florida Democratic gubernatorial primary. He was outspent as much as 43 to 1 in the primary and literally wasn't even showing up on some of the polls of in, even in third place in the primary. Unbelievable. Gillum's GOP opponent, Ron DeSantis, you know, a uh, one of the guys been knighted by Trump, went on Fox News the following morning and said that Florida shouldn't monkey this up. He was talking about primates. <laughs> That's all. Oh, boy. Paul Manafort tried to take a page out of Art of the Deal with Robert Mueller. That didn't work out so well. So now he's going back on trial. Yep. Looks like the 17th the jury is going to be picked. Beto O'Rourke is in a dead tie. Dead tie with Ted Cruz. You know, punk rocker, skater dude. <laughs> he's going up against Ted Cruz. Though the Texas GOP attacks Beto for his skateboarding skills and history of punk rock band on Twitter. Of course, that backfires because Ted Cruz's team is so good at social media. <laughs> oh, boy. The death toll in Puerto Rico from Hurricane Maria has been revised from like 65 to 2,975 people. That's 2,975 people who have died. That makes... Ooh, the death toll there significantly higher than Katrina. Democrats in D.C. gave the green light to fast track the confirmation of 15 Trump appointed federal judges so that they could, you know, go home. Trump now has appointed more circuit court justices than any president in history at this point in their term. According to a new report, the Living Planet Index 2018. The world is on track to lose two-thirds of its wild animals by 2020, which is good, which leaves more space for humans, development, and stuff. The state of Kansas let residents in two Wichita-area neighborhoods drink water contaminated with dry cleaning chemicals for more than six years. You just didn't get around to telling people. It was just an error. It was a mistake. Faulty communication lines. Crazy. Trump tries to start a Google conspiracy theory (laughs) and ends up in kind of weird places that like the left has been arguing for a while. So whatever, we'll get into that just a little bit. And today's PA focus, the latest Franklin and Marshall poll shows that Scott Wagner, oh man, race is tightening. Scott Wagner and Lou Barletta are getting smoked (laughs) at the general election. And by race is tightening, I mean like their personal like well-being is tightening and we're waiting for the explosion. Scott Wagner bombs at every at, at, at the ever so swanky and insiders Pennsylvania press club uh, club luncheon. Right, he did have a nice suit. <laughs> it's about the suit showed up. Wagner didn't show up very well. <laughs> Wagner started by attacking Wolf on education, claiming that he's the only candidate that is right on education. Wagner wants to increase education spending by one. Is that a is that is that a billion dollars, Sean? Yes, that's a billion dollars. One billion dollars by cutting property taxes and cutting welfare programs and other departments. So you're going to cut income to the state. And you're going to spend. I do not know I that. Uh, he then called out the media and specifically attacked John Bear for reporting on his jokes on Russia and other mishaps rather than reporting on the actual issues in this race. Okay. If that wasn't enough, Wagner then blows off the media and escapes the press luncheon as if you were finishing an Ocean's Eleven heist with the sounds of, Mr. Wagner, are your people underpaid? <laughs> Scotty dodged that question as well. Scott Wagner's eagle disposal went to, uh, went two whole calendar years without properly filling out injury reports. right? Um, and this was reported in the American Ledger, and it was after an employee was killed. And uh, we'll get into that a little bit. That was a pretty disturbing story, if you ask me. 
And Kutztown University President Kenneth Hawkinson tells the campus on opening day that buildings are fine, money has been spent, nothing to see here. Uh, tell that to the mold in Lytle Hall, Hawkinson. In today's last call, NASA wants lots of people in space, according to Trump-appointed NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. In particular, he wants to put people on the moon and establish moon gateways to the rest of the solar system. The dust storm, well, it's actually kind of subsiding on Mars now, finally. Does this mean that the Opportunity rover will wake up? I mean, Opportunity was only supposed to last 90 days, and now it's been on the surface of Mars working for more than 15 years, logging more than 28 miles of exploration. International Space Station sprung a leak this week. Could space junk be the culprit? And Free Will had a double can release this week, right? Scarecrow Autumn Spiced Ale. Um, that is coming out uh, tomorrow. No, that came out yesterday. Cloudy with a Chance of Pepperoni is coming out tomorrow. Um, and I mentioned this last week. I just picked up some Bitter Buddha. Um, and I'll give you an update on that. It's fantastic. And Sean throws down the gauntlet when it comes to Philly's best sandwiches. He's coming home this Labor Day. All right, we'll see. Sean's going to start a Twitter war over what's the best sandwich in Philly. Remind everybody, tune in to Rick Smith Show on Free Speech TV this and every Saturday at 7 p.m. Eastern. You can stream the show at freespeech.org. You can also tune in on Dish Network, DirecTV, or through the Free Speech TV app on Roku. If you missed the show, just go to ricksmithshow.com, click on the Free Speech TV icon on the sidebar, or just go right to freespeech.org and go to the Rick Smith Show archives. Want to remind everybody, yes, sir, if you want a progressive future, we need progressive media. You can help support Pull No Punches, homegrown progressive media today. Become a member of Raging Chicken for as little as five bucks a month. Just go to patreon.com slash rcpress and choose your membership level. Not ready to become a member? No problem. Just go to RagingChickenPress.org and click on the blue, big blue donate button on the right sidebar. Whatever you want. Ten, twenty, five hundred dollars, we'll take it all. With the 2018 midterm elections, just like 67, 67 days, something like that, around the corner, we need to make sure to keep the movement in the media and the media in the movement. The best way to do that is become a member of Raging Chicken Press by going to patreon.com slash rcpress today. Well, here we are, Sean, on the cusp of Labor Day weekend, um, and you're going to be headed back to the area. Yeah, I'll be heading down to Philly uh, right after this podcast, actually. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. It's good to hear. And uh, it's, uh, you know, I'm glad that the uh, that Labor Day is indeed here. I'm back to school. You're going to get to celebrate a little stuff. We're going to talk a little about that in the uh, the last call today. Um, but today is another one of those absolutely insane weeks. Uh, once again, um, having to, I don't know, cherry pick really uh, what we can actually talk about in the news today. It's just been absolutely huge in a national level. And uh, Scott Wagner continues to, you know, we get to PA uh, segment today. Scott Wagner is continuing to go off the rails. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's been something. It's been something. Yes, it has. It was, it, it's, for me, it's been a fun week. It's been a fun week. <clears throat> yeah. Scott's been on the Wagner tip. Yeah, for the rest of us uh, who are not just, you know, uh, be able to do that, it's been kind of a crappy one. But that's all right, Sean. That's all right. I'm glad you're enjoying the the watching hell burn. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got front row seats. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty awesome. Um, so let's just, I mean, let's just get this out of the way now. One, uh, 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 Senator, former Senator John McCain um, died this week. Um, the news was kind of dominated um, yesterday in particular. Um, his funeral ceremonies were there. Um, Biden's uh, his speech at his uh, at the funeral was, uh, you know, it went crazy all over, you know, the mainstream media and everything like this. Um, and I, I want to this is what I mean by what I was saying in the, in the introduction here about walking and chewing gum at the same time is that, look. I'm I'm not I'm the last person in the world who's going to try to, you know, take anything away from that guy from, you know, the service that he gave to the country for the fact that he was a prisoner of war. Um, and and, you know, look and like him he or did hate fix him, Sarah Palin. <clears throat> well, that's well, that that's the that's the chewing gum part. Right. The walking. Part, right? That's <laughs> that's like the second thing that we got to do at the same time. Right. Because, you know, look, there, there's no doubt the guy gave a tremendous amount of service and he deserves, you know, that to be remembered. Right. And I'm I'm fine with that. Right. Um, But it's just like, you know, we talked about this before on the podcast about in American history. Right. It's like 
we got to be able to do two things, like more than one thing at once, right? We can say, for example, look, we could be proud that like, or whatever, we could look at all the kind of like achievements in that have happened in American history and say, yeah, we feel good about that. But that doesn't mean we can't then also talk about like the genocide of American Indians and, and hundreds of years of slavery, right? Those both things were true, right? And you can't just like throw one one out without the other and just kind of sugarcoat it all and only look at the happy stuff, right? So, you know, because arguably, you know, John McCain's like choice to bring Sarah Palin into the, and you know, as his running mate um, really set the table for Trump. Right. Set the table for where we are now, the rise of the alt right, giving the kind of like Tea Party a platform and all that. I don't know if it was I I believe like it was going in that direction anyway. Like we like we were going down that road. Yes. Yes. Sarah Palin just hyper just sped that sped the process up. Oh, sure. But what I'm saying is that 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 decision to make her the running gate like gave it a legitimate platform. Right. So, yes, it was already going that way. But when you start putting that person on on the presidential ticket, a vice presidential ticket. Right. That's kind of like helping authorize that and bring that into the mainstream. Right. We have to kind of remember we have to remember that, you know, yes, McCain made some really kind of important votes, um, but he's not been good in a whole lot of other stuff. So. We can remember that stuff. So but, you know, definitely rest in peace, John McCain. Um, <clears throat> we'll kind of and we'll, for me, we'll like, say that. Um, I guess yesterday was uh, one of the things that like, so one of the things that came to my mind yesterday when I was watching, I watched a little bit of Biden's eulogy. Yeah. Um, I actually went back and watched the video when Biden got the medal of honor. Mm-hmm. And for me, like what yesterday was another moment where the institutions that are collapsing around us mm-hmm. were, are insulating themselves inward. Like I, like I feel like that they are trying to insulate themselves from like the, the themselves from collapsing, even though they are collapsing. Like, you know, when Obama gave Biden the the Medal of Honor, right, right. You know, I think that was just more like a everything is fine type of moment. Like yep. after Trump gets elected, and I felt like that's the same thing yesterday. Like everything is fine type of thing, where you know we have this nostalgia, uh, like this this false sense of nostalgia. No, I mean, you know, and I we, mean, like, we, yes, like, like McCain was one of the most influential senators, probably, um, you know, like I just. I'm more and more upset of like this. Uh, this like whole like the way the Senate institution wants to insulate himself around him. Like, yeah, yeah. why should the Russell Senate office building be named after John McCain? Right. Yes. Russell, like someone on our fa- my Facebook page, Russell was extremely anti civil rights. But John McCain also voted against MLK Day. Right. Like, if we're going to name the Senate Russell building office after someone, why don't we want to, like, name, where's that, like, fervor to name it after someone like Ted Kennedy? You know, like, who actually got a lot of stuff done. Well, that's what actually bothered me. Actually, that was one of the things that bothered me most about the week. And not because, because I, I thought, because you saw who was, who was out in front proposing that, right? Schumer, yes. Schumer, right? And I, frank, frankly, I thought that that was just a a cynical political ploy on his part. I think that he thought that by proposing it um, uh, to changing it to McCain, that that was going to speak to a a a kind of politics where you can work across the aisle and was going to be a thumb and a nose to Trump. I, I like I, I just. The fact that he came out so quickly on that, just that really... I mean, like, the body wasn't even cold at that point. Like, Not and, exactly. Exactly. And, yeah, no, like, like if we're going to name the Senate office building after someone, like, yes, McCain, all that stuff is true about him, but, I mean, he also had some really shitty votes and some really shitty policy positions that, like, we shouldn't, like, gloss over the fact that... Because we should do this just because he just passed away. Like, I mean... Right. The like the, yes, uh, but uh, like if we're going to name the Senate building after someone, like where was that fervor after Ted Kennedy died? When Ted Kennedy was probably one of the most influential senators, probably in the past under two hundred years, right? And who did not come with that baggage? Yes, he came from a Kennedy family, but I mean, he really, he really like reformed Chappaquitic. himself. What's that? <laughs> Chappaquiddick. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> 
but no, I mean, your point's well taken. I mean, that's it. And, you know, that was one of the kind of things where, um, I, I don't know. I don't know. So, you know, rest in peace, John McCain. Um, but let's keep our heads in this, folks. You know, um, if we can't turn, as Sean was saying, to this kind of nostalgic idea about what things should be, um, these institutions really are um, being destroyed around us. They're not just falling apart on their own. A lot of them are being destroyed, especially by an assault for the right wing, right? And simply a kind of like, you know, kind of straightening our shirt and kind of returning to civility is not going to do it. Right. And we've talked about that a lot in this show. Um, it's not just about decorum, right. It's about policy and politics and organizing. Right. Um, and so, you know, let give him his, you know, his, his week in the sun and all that kind of stuff, but let's not, you know, we can, we can take the rose colored glasses off and look at things like in the clear light of day um, as well. So anyways, so let's move on. So let's go, let's go to, I mean, let's go to uh, Florida. I mean, Florida, Sean, I mean, did you see this coming? No, <laughs> I didn't even know who this guy was. Gillum? Gillum. Mayor Andrew Gillum from Tallahassee um, shocked the political world, like world really this week um, by pulling off a huge upset. And a Bernie game. Sanders back candidate. And what's that? And a Bernie back candidate. Yep. Bernie back candidate. And um, uh, this guy, like I said in the intro, he was not even on like hitting the polls that he was going to even come in third. Right. I mean, that he was just going to be off the charts that he wasn't going to get much vote. And he won significant numbers. Yeah. No. And I um, one of the things I believe this shows you, like um, one of the things I've been talking about lately, the new American majority, which is college age students, uh, m- single mothers, college educated mo- women and minor- like people of the African-American and African-American and Latino communities. Like that, this is what propelled him in this victory. Um, you know, uh, Doug Jones beating Roy Moore again. It was black women and men who uh, pushed him forward. And you know, like we're seeing the same thing down south. Um, we're seeing this with uh, Tracy. Was it Tracy Abrams? Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, Stacy Abrams. St- Abrams. Stacy a- Abrams yep, out of yep. Georgia. Um, no one really expected her to win. Uh, we're seeing this here in Flor- in Florida. I know. I really think we're starting to see the South. I think with that and the the stuff with Beto or work, uh, we're, we're, I think we're starting to see the South turn blue. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing it. I mean, especially when you have. I mean, you look at the numbers and where people showed up in Florida um, for that election. I mean, and the and the the percentage and like you know, and there's certain districts like you look at Dade County, um, and then. Um, uh, I'm just I'm spacing the name of the other county. It was like the num that, that um who was who was the the uh, the favorite candidate? I'm just spacing her name right now. Uh, I, I'm not sure, but it was she was part of a political dynasty. Yeah, and she was basically she was expected to kind of like hold her own in some of these um some of these districts, and she, and she was blown out. I mean, she was blown out. Um, Gillum just like just <laughs> did amazing, and a lot of it was like kind of old school politics, right? I mean, we're just kind of like going around, um, talking to people, talking to small groups, talking to anybody who would listen um, and um, bringing forth a message that, that resonated obviously. And a lot of the polling, like once again, the polling was completely off, right? Because, and this, this goes to show you right to your point about this kind of new American majority, because um, all these, all the polling was based upon like likely voters, Right, it was based upon who they expected to come out, but the people who came out, clearly in terms of their politics, but also in terms of their um, their um, economic background and their racial background, right, and their locations, that was significantly different, right. So that was what you know um, kind of helped turn the tables. Now this sets up, I think, an, just an, an absolutely incredible election come the fall, because now you've got. Um, you know, uh, uh, Gillum running against Ron DeSantis, which is kind of like, you know, this like little like Trump wannabe that Trump has have kind of supported. So we've got like, you know, the left and the kind of like off the rails right um, going toe to toe in Florida. So, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. And it's like the alt right that's running. <clears throat> with yeah, DeSantis. that's right. That's right. So well, we'll see, man. Yeah. We'll see. I don't know. Just let that sit for a minute. That was amazing. <clears throat> that was amazing. I haven't seen but just also, haven't seen direction results like that in a long time. You, you also like he was outspent forty three to one. Yeah. Like I saw something on uh, NPR website. Um, he 
spent like five hundred and eighty thousand dollars in campaign money, yep. while like the leading Democrat or the leading person in that primary period spent like over twenty seven million dollars or twenty six million dollars. And it goes to show you what the power of door knocking and one on one interactions have been the importance of that. Like uh, down here in uh, Lancaster County, uh, there's the Jess King campaign. I mean, they're making phone calls, but they're also been knocking on doors the whole entire summer. And it's like, you know, there, there's, there's this new model of election campaigning coming up where, you know what, screw the TV ads, screw making the consultants rich off of this, spend your money, spend your resources and dedicate it towards a field team, field staff and door knocking. Yep. Yep. And we're going to see what's going to go on now with the, uh, you know, the racial politics of all this, because you already have DeSantis, um, you know, throwing out his dog whistles this week. More like trumpets. Yeah, trumpets. <laughs> I don't, or a, a tuba. <laughs> no, exactly. There ain't no whistle. <laughs> there ain't no whistle. Yeah, good point. Yeah, he, so he came out this week, Ron DeSantis, who was on Fox News, um, and he said, Florida shouldn't monkey this up, right, when it comes to the governorship, right? Um, which, you know, anyone that has been paying attention to, like, their lives as they walk <laughs> through it knows that, you know, this was clearly... Um, Code for him saying, hey, I'm your guy. I'm your guy. Hey, clan. <laughs> hey, white people, right? So because- actually, I had, so- I had somebody at the market stop me. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the guys I, I, get, I, I talk to, and he, he was like, do you see what this, that guy from Florida did? He kind of like just went on team and raised his hands and says, Hey, everyone, I'm your man. Vote for me. <laughs> like, he's like, he's like, well, he wasn't even trying to hide his racism. And I'm like, Yeah, you're right about that. There you go. Crazy, man. <clears throat> yeah. So then we got, uh, you know, we've, we see now increasing developments here. And I don't want to spend a ton of time on it, but, you know, you got the uh, Paul Manafort looking like he was going to, uh, he was trying to strike a deal that we find out now. So here's the, here's the question I've got. So, so Manafort this week, we find out that, um, you know, he was trying to strike a deal um, with uh, Mueller for uh, who knows what what the deal was. Right. There's a lot of speculation that is a full cooperation agreement, or whatever like this. But um, the prosecution basically said, uh-uh, we're not going to do this. So, you know, most likely it was that there was some limited cooperation or limited information or something like this or pleading guilty. Only one charge another that so was trying to get worked out. We don't really know. Um, but I, I think I do think it's a little much to say that uh, Manafort's ready to flip, right? I'm not so sure about that, but um, th- but that completely failed. So, But here's the thing now, right? So now that that's out in the media, right, Trump has been making all this noise about wanting to pardon Manafort, right? But now if Trump thinks that Manafort <laughs> is like ready to flip on him, right, Manafort could just be like, you know, might as well get ready to settle into his new apartment in federal prison. You know what I mean? I mean, I don't know what you think about this, but this is what, you know, that's what I was, that was going through my head this week. Yeah. I, I, I think he's more or less trying to save himself from getting killed in prison. <clears throat> I mean, I, I mean, the man just sort of like, uh, I mean, he's stuck in between a rock and a hard place here. Uh, he like, what, what, He's going to need protection if he gets pardoned. I mean, he blew off a bunch of Russian mobsters and stuff like that, oligarchs. What, 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 what did he do? Well, no, didn't he like um, like like the, some of the people like he lo- loaned him money and he never returned their phone calls, stuff like that. Oh, like that you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like I mean, there's, I yeah, I mean, but that's what I, I think. think. I think this, I think his his I think his. Uh, take is more on self-preservation at this point yeah like and like self-preservation as in like you know staying alive right yes <clears throat> but i i thought that was his reason for not you know actually not cooperating whatsoever from the beginning i thought that he knows that the minute he starts talking right then it becomes increasingly dangerous right the more he says right so uh, like in some ways i'm surprised that he didn't actually just go out and uh and plead guilty to all the charges right Yep, I'm guilty. 
<clears throat> right? And just kind of like, you know, then the evidence never comes forward, the witnesses come forward and everything like that. But instead, they opted for two trials. And now he's got the second trial that's coming up. And I don't know if you saw, like, uh, like Maddow was reading through the transcripts of the, tri- of the trial this week, and it was like, it was actually hilarious. Like, the, the Manafort lawyers sound like they're, they're um, you know, playing at law. Like, they were totally not prepared for this to happen. And they're like, oh, we're not ready. We're not ready. And she's just like, the judge is kind of like, what do you mean? <laughs> He's get ready. I don't know what to tell you people. And also like the, the judge that uh, he that was presiding over his first case is the more favorable judge. Right. Exactly. So, so now he's right. Exactly. So now he's going in here and then, um, now he's going to, um, to, you know, stuff that actually gets more specifically into the Russia stuff. Right. So, I mean, I just think that Manafort is shaking in his boots. The fact that he knows that, look, if he, he's at the point now where if this goes to trial, uh, if it actually truly does go to trial, that means the evidence is going to be shown about these connections and that's going to expose some of these people in, um, in Russia. Um, it, but if he pleads guilty to this point, you know, he's forget it. That's the rest of his life in prison. Right. Um, sort of dire consequences. And now that, now that we find out that, uh, that he was trying to reach a deal, that big question is out for me is like, maybe Trump's just like, he's doing what? Let that guy rot in prison then. <laughs> right. So man, he's got to get out that Grecian formula and uh, you know, get moving on. So oh man. Oh man. So there's that. Um Beta O'Rourke, man. You've been all over this guy this week. Yes, I have. <laughs> yeah, do tell. So um he actually I think he's been refusing some debates with Ted Cruz. Um and the uh, uh Grandpa Munster. <laughs> So the, uh, the, 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 the Texas GOP uh, went on to Twitter and made a bunch of memes of Beto. Um, a couple of them, one dealt with, a, one was a mugshot with a DWI that he like is completely owned up to. Mm-hmm. And the charges were dropped after he completed an, an ARD program pretty much. Uh, and this happened back like 25 years ago. And he pretty much it, it owned it. He's like, there's no excuse for me doing this, blah, blah, blah. I went through the process, had everything dropped, and has not had an incident since. The other stuff that they've been attacking him on um, is his skateboarding abilities. <laughs> they, they put a meme up. Uh, Beto, the real liability, I hear, for a political office. <laughs> yeah. Beto would rather be skateboarding, out skateboarding, than debating Ted Cruz. And it's a picture of him holding up his skateboard. Mm-hmm. And then they found a picture of him uh, where they're all, like him and his former bandmates, dressed up in drag. Uh-huh. And it's like, Beto has a gig to play. He doesn't feel like debating Ted Cruz. Uh-huh. And... Um, Needless to say, uh, the ratios <laughs> were not in their favor on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Apparently, the cool factor of beta has been going through the roof since the, the, the GOP. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they like, just stabbed themselves in the foot, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, no, here's this guy, here's his guy. He's gonna, he skateboards. He was in a punk rock band. <laughs> he plays all his music. He goes out and skates with people. Let's let's use that in an attack ad. <laughs> now he just basically woke up any voter under thirty who is not already paying attention. I'm like, whoa, this guy's awesome. Well, yeah, I think I have a couple of friends in Texas, like just Facebook friends and all from like mm-hmm. I've made over the years, and they're sharing stuff like, like in the music scene of like, hey, Beto played with the guy from Mars Volta, of course we should vote for him. Like, <laughs> like, exactly. like Cedric Bixler Zavala and that whole entire crew from uh, the Mars Volta and at the drive-in, they're treated like gods in southern Texas along the border in El Paso. And even throughout the whole entire art community, throughout the whole entire state, because it's one of the best rock bands to ever come out of the state. And now they're trying to make it a, now he's like, yeah, I played, yeah, I used to play in a band with Cedric from the Mars Volta. And so in response, he started releasing some of the tracks that they used to. Oh, my God. Are you serious? That's awesome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like DYI Punk from back in the mid-90s. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's awesome. When, he, when they were in college together. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. So, that, so that's going to be and – and you were telling me right before you went on today, like the polls have basically pulled even, right? Yeah. They're, they're pretty much even at like 38 40%. Oh, great. Well, you know, again, we have to um, – 
remember Florida, <laughs> remember 2016, the polls only mean so much, but still, um, this has been then pretty remarkable. Um, the fact that, you know, he's got a shot at taking out Ted Cruz is, uh, is absolutely amazing. Right. I mean, you know, after, after Ted Cruz, whether the, you know, the major criticism, when, you know, when it was found out that his dad had a role in uh, assassinating JFK. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, did not. But that's what Trump claimed, of course. <clears throat> um, but yeah, so Beta Rourke. So that's that's awesome. Um, now, just kind of a couple of things. One thing I, I hope people saw the news this week, because this is really I mean, this is important. We talked about this a lot, you know, right when it was going on. But the. the Everything in Puerto Rico is not back to even close to normal at this point. Um, basically, like federal. And the aid fact is, that we're still dealing with this year later is a fucking disgrace. Yeah, and for the longest time, like Trump was just like a couple weeks ago was basically talking about, hey, look how great a great job we did down there. There was only you know like a handful of people, sixty five people that died. Right, look at Katrina. There were hundreds, hundreds, of thousands of people that died down there. But we didn't do that in Puerto Rico, right? Because of course. <laughs> was a political catastrophe for George W. Bush, right? I mean, that was huge. That was just like, that was hung around his neck, right? That what, what he did and, and his lack of action. But in Puerto Rico, you know, because uh, we're Americans and Puerto Rico is a colony and this is kind of doesn't Full make it into people. the news. Right, exactly. Um, They're not real Americans. Well, they don't speak American, so, um, right. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, it's like... Uh, this has been ongoing, right? The power has still not been restored. And so now there's a study that just came out of George Washington University because one of the problems was like, right, official death toll, death tolls are, they depend upon data that comes from doctors and hospitals and things like this, right? Well, if your power struck, you know, infrastructure is not functioning properly, right? You're still doing massive repairs to the infrastructure just to get back up and running, right? Computer networks are up and down, right? Communication infrastructure is spotty, right? Um, and transport, you know, like I said, the roads are out and everything like this. You, you assembling those those numbers is hard to do. So this team from George Washington University went down and basically did that, right? Kind of went down and try to gather all the information kind of across the um, um, uh, uh, across Puerto Rico and assemble it in one place. And they came up with a number of 2,975 people who have died, right? That's, you know, that number includes, just like in any kind of natural disaster, includes the people that were immediately killed by the storm, you know, from like falling buildings and stuff like this, right? Drowning and things like this. Um, and then everyone who died as a consequence of the storm, like we saw with Katrina, right? So there were people had no access to their diabetes medication and died, right? Um, access, you know, had, had kind of internal wounds and infections and things like this, could not get access to medications and died, right? Um, people died, you know, weeks later after, from injuries from the storm, all that stuff taken together. Um, people who didn't have electricity, so they couldn't kind of um, keep on dialysis, right? And died. Um, this is like a, a national... Disgrace. Disgrace. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and I know <clears throat> how it is. It's not in the news cycle, right? Um, it's not front and center. We're living in a kind of absolutely insane um, political um, time. Everything's in turmoil. Um, but, you know, if you can, right, um, look for ways to kind of support what's going on in Puerto Rico um, and um, and don't let what happened in Puerto Rico and the, um, the travesty um, – that, that was perpetrated and facilitated by the Trump administration, um, not kind of go going all hands on deck and helping that helping out and get that uh, making sure those people didn't die. And let's never let him live that down because that is um, that it's just devastating. So, um, speaking of the need to have a spine, the uh, Democrats, Chuck Schumer. Chuck Schumer in particular, right? Um, this is Sean, this, this is just the kind of stuff that I, I, I mean, I'm losing my ability to get frustrated at this point with this because it's just so typical. Um, so Schumer. Okay. So look, as we've said before in this program, you know, elections have consequences. And one of the biggest consequences we're seeing right now, um, this week coming up, we're going to start seeing hearings, right. About the Supreme court. Right. Um, Kavanaugh is going to be without, even, uh, without his records even being right. published or available for the senators to go through. Exactly. So they're going to try to force through this. Right. And 
these one of the major consequences towards the courts, right? So what's on the table right now? This guy gets um, this guy gets um, confirmed to go to the Supreme Court's so lifetime appointment, and at risk are things like I don't know national labor laws, uh, you know Roe v. Wade, <laughs> right? Uh, transgender rights, right? Same sex marriage. I mean, right across the board, all these kind of some of the victories that we've had. Right, and then the long-standing fights that have been won are now eventually going to be all rolled back, right? Precisely because that you've got a Republican Party that they can say whatever they want about Trump's demeanor or the way that he talks to people. They're all they care about is getting it stocked with because conservative right-wing people on the court. They, they want. They want. They want. They want the. I mean, they want to undo the 1960s civil rights legislation. Totally, they, absolutely. Like they want to be able to deny a black or brown or gay person the right to serve them because their religion says so. Exactly. Or like exactly. they're infringing on their speech. Yep. Or their, their, their religious liberty. Yep, absolutely. Like my Jesus was a white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, you know, yep. Aryan, Aryan Jesus. And therefore... You know, I should be able to uh, deny the right to service to anyone who doesn't look like him. I mean, those are the type of bullshit arguments we're, we'll probably be seeing in the future. No, absolutely. And but here's and here's what it, like let me just give people context, right? So Schumer struck this deal with McConnell, right, to basically expedite votes on 15 of his nominees, and these are for lifetime federal court seats, right? Because they had to go home and they had to you know for the Labor Day weekend. They're coming back next week. They could have kept it going. Right, but they need to get home. They need to get home so they can campaign and things like this. They right, have parades to go to. Right, exactly. But so normally, Senate rules require up to thirty hours of waiting time for each nominee. Right, something that Democrats have typically tip- they've been taking advantage of that to delay acting on the confirmation of Trump judges. Right, that's even more important right now as you see all these other kind of inquiries going into uh, the Trump organization and potential collusion stuff, but more of the kind of the criminal stuff too as well. Um, but no, they need to get home. So they agreed to boom. We're just going to kind of like, like run these things through, run these people through. So that means now, right. Just put this in perspective, right. We've talked about circuit U S circuit courts before, right. That means right now that one in seven U S circuit court seats are now filled by a judge that had nominated by Trump one in seven, right. That is, that is going to impact us for the next like generation. And I'm sorry, but these things you gotta you gotta fight over this stuff. You can't and just say, "Hey, we need to get we get, need to get back to normal times of campaigning." No, part of your campaign is to show that you're gonna fight this garbage. But, and this is like one of the things that like I have problems with the Democratic Party is they pick their leadership based on seniority, right? When Republicans pick pick their leadership based on merit. And well, I don't know if it's really by merit. <laughs> Let's be honest with you. <laughs> but no, but, but they, they they use that like that that merit based selection instead of like, well, you've been here the longest, so you get this this position. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah it's. I, I mean, I yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. What are you gonna say? You know what I'm saying? What are you gonna say? <laughs> and. uh yeah, so then just a couple of kind of quick things to, to take us out uh, take us out to the break. Uh, according to the new report from Living Planet, well, it's Living Planet Index. It's actually uh, by World Wildlife Fund, and I think the British Zoological Society um, kind of collaborated on it. And we're basically on track to lose about two thirds of the wild animals by 2020. Um, a lot of that has to do with um, kind of overdevelopment and logging and that kind of stuff, but um, <clears throat> the uh, let me see if I can find the little statistic here. Um, we're seeing that yeah, so the biggest cause of the numbers, and you know, again, what do we say? We say by two thirds. It's not just just happened just recently. This is since the 1970s. We see the loss of this. We're seeing the loss of um, um. Well, here we put it in this perspective. First, the majority of the Earth's land area has now been impacted by humans. Just 15 percent um, protected um, for nature. Uh, 300 mammal, mammal species are being eaten into extinction. And then rivers and lakes are the hardest hit habitats, right? particular things like climate change and other things with animal populations down by 81% since 1970 due to pay attention, uh, pro frackers, um, due to excessive water extraction, pollution, and dams, right? 
Um, and global warming right now, climate change is only exacerbating this, and we, they expect it to sp speed up this process of extinction. So um, not good news, right? Um, and the waterland, too, as well. The state of Kansas. This is the story that just caught my eye, right, especially after what happened in Flint. Um, you see it in Kansas. Now, why Kansas matters, right, and why this kind of stood out for me is, you know, this was the great Kansas experiment. Right. Kansas is the one that went off the rails and kind of went total kind of uh, kind of like libertarian utopia, you know, where you, you deregulate everything and you kind of turn everything over to private industry and all that. And it works out so well. Not so much. Right. Kansas is like in virtual collapse at this point. Right. Um, the infrastructure is down. Its economy is tanked. It's like everything that is gone wrong that people, you know, in the center to the left has said, these right wing kind of libertarian policies are, are not good for people. They might be good for the pockets of a few capitalists, but that's it. And sure enough, that that's what's happened in Kansas. So one of the consequences are these everyday things that we see. Right. So there were two uh, area neighborhoods in uh, in Wichita um, that there had been testing that had been done. There was a chemical spill um, of these dry cleaning chemicals, right. That leached into the water, right. Now the state, of course, you know, probably under understaffed, right. Didn't have enough people, whatever it goes like. They tested the area right where the spill was, right. But just didn't get around to going down and kind of testing individual of uh, people's wells. Right. Um, but then they still knew that the water had leached into those wells. Right. Eventually. And then they just never told the people. So they let people drink contaminated water for six years. Right. So keep an eye on this because, uh, you know, my, my guess is there's going to be some major um, kind of litigation coming down. Um, out yeah, here, so. it sort of sounds like what's happening back home outside of uh, we're really right down the street from my house, my home with the Willow Grove Air Force Base in exactly. Montgomery County. Uh, there's been a big government cover up been going on for the past couple of years now uh, where, uh, you know, um, foam propellant from uh, the, the foam chemicals Fire retardant. Yeah. Fire, yeah, have been leaking, leaching into the ground, which then going into the water table and all the, the well, the water drink, the drinking water in the area. And it was at this base. And then also the uh, decommissioned um, base on Bristol road down further um, yep. in like Northampton. Yep. I think. Yep. Yeah. So there you go. There you go. Oh, boy. And then, then my favorite part of the week was uh, Trump started to decide that the real, the big problem that's out there right now, he's doubling down on the fake news stuff, is basically saying there's a conspiracy out there by Google um, to alter the search results um, so that they only come up with bad stories about it. <laughs> Which or maybe you're just a fucking this. idiot. Right, right. Or maybe, you know, this is just reporting. And right, this is the stuff that people are reading because they're learning about. I was good. But just the one little little tidbit about this that was just like fascinating to see, because this is like how I blame I blame this on Q, QAnon. Totally. No, no. QAnon planted the seed. <laughs> right. And it grew. Right. This is. uh but no, these are the conspiracy theories that are kind of out there. And there was these kind of like reports on Trump that was just our you know, reports um, on Fox News that Trump apparently watched, of course. Right. And then basically said, ah, there's a problem. Look at here what they're doing, what they're doing. But the very the interesting thing is he comes out, Trump comes out and he told Bloomberg News right in this this interview in the Oval Office that um, he's like, he said companies like Amazon, Facebook, and Google as a there's a very antitrust situation going on there, right? He said, it's not good. It's not good, right? Um, he re he watched this news segment that was like on Fox News that w was reporting on this this very very you know just complete partisan hackery study that came out quote unquote study um, that um, search results were slanted to the right. And uh, he comes out and says, look, it's really bad what's doing for this. And we're going to have to take a look at this. So they might actually, right, there's some people in the Trump, the Trump organization who actually want to pursue, right, antitrust um, legislation or like against like Google and that. Now, what's crazy about that is like, you know, I'm on board with the antitrust stuff when it comes to Google, Facebook, Amazon, all that stuff. But you got to remember people, right? This is the same problem that, um, that, that, uh, that labor is having when it comes to like, uh, tariffs and stuff, right? Is that you got to re you got to put this stuff in context, right? Cause it's not, you know, it's like, why is it being done and how is it being thought through? So the Trump administration wants to go after Google, right? For antitrust, not so that 
we're going to have a fairer marketplace and there's going to be more options and you're not going to have like, you know, the Google empire take over. No, it's just so that they control it. So they could only say nice things about him. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> right. There's nothing in that. That's good for us. <laughs> right. In the long run. So anyways, so that's just one of these stories. I mean, and apparently they think that that's caught some fire. So they're, we're going to be seeing more of that in the upcoming weeks. So I actually have a quick Q story. Yeah. Oh, please. So um, someone, was wearing a QAnon t-shirt at a uh, Wagner town hall the other day. Awesome. And he was trying to get it. This person from what I heard from one of my friends that was there, uh, was trying to, uh, ask a question at the, <laughs> the QAnon person was. Yes. And they were feverishly working around him and just ignoring this guy completely. <laughs> oh my God. Was he like, Ooh, 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 me, 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 call me, call me. <laughs> Oh man! Well, that's a that's a that's a good point to come to the break because then we can uh, we're gonna, gonna slide into the the week in Wagner, <laughs> basically in today's Pennsylvania uh, Pennsylvania stuff. All right, so yeah, we're gonna go to the break. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. We want to remind you, you can help support uh, progressive activist media right here in Pennsylvania, homegrown right here in Pennsylvania by going to patreon.com slash RC press today and become a member for as little as five bucks a month. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. We'll be back right after this. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1921. That was the day the Battle of Blair Mountain raged in Logan County, West Virginia. Members of the United Mine Workers of America were attempting to organize the minefields in the southern part of the state. The efforts to bring workers to Union was met with violent resistance. The miners armed themselves and marched south. As many as 10,000 miners joined the march. They met armed company men at Blair Mountain. In the battle that ensued, one million rounds were fired. The mine owners even hired private planes to drop bombs on Union miners. The U.S. Army intervened and the battle ended. Despite not being successful in their march, the bloody battle brought national attention to the violence in the coal fields. But that was not the last battle for Blair Mountain. In 2011, there was a proposal to bring mountaintop removal mining to Blair Mountain. This type of mining blasts off large chunks of a mountain surface to get at the coal seams below. Protesters stood against the proposal. They argued it would be environmentally devastating to the area. They also argued that it would blast away one of the most important sites of labor history in the nation. Some coal miners took exception to the protests. In a CNN documentary on the conflict, one union miner said, quote, Mountaintop removal is what built this house, sends that little girl to school, provides insurance for my wife. But another miner joined in the protest against removal. He told CNN that miners had been, quote, brainwashed to think, oh, I can't have a job unless it's a mountaintop removal job. In 2014, the state prohibited surface mining at Blair Mountain. For now, but that is subject to change. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Labor History in 2. Welcome back to Raging Chickens Out the Coop podcast. Well, it was, Sean, would you call it the week in Wagner? I don't know. What do you say? <laughs> I guess so. Um, I, where 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 should we start off with? Uh, well, why, why don't we start with start with some of the the polling that's coming out here? Because it's like, look, man, th- this is th- things are tightening up, right? <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> tightening up to a um, a, a massive meltdown. <laughs> so, um, no surprise uh, this week. Um, Franklin Marshall came out with its latest poll and uh, Scott Wagner and Lou Barletta are getting smoked like a, like a pig roast on uh, Labor Day weekend. <laughs> 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 um, uh, pretty much the, the Wagner, they're both down by like 14 to 20 points, 14 to 17 points each. Wagner is polling 17 points behind Wolf and Barletta is polling uh, 13 points behind um, Casey. A couple of things I found interesting looking at the cross tabs, right? Yeah. Uh, so, like this past week, uh, New York Times came out with a story about um, 
the surge of youth voter registration in Pennsylvania. And Pennsylvania is like one of the only like three or four states in the country uh, where um, the, there are more registered voters of 35 and under uh, than those 65 and over, which is pretty significant considering you think when people think of Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania is normally like an older aging uh, state, you know, where the demographics are temp- typically people think they're more retirees, older people. Right. And um, we now have more uh, millennials and um, Generation Z re- teenagers, pretty much turning 18, who are registered to vote. Um, this is what I call the young and naive demographics. Mm-hmm. Um, Wagner is getting smoked 52 to like 31 in that demographic. So it's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's tightening. You just like this. Yeah. <laughs> and. Um, he is another thing I saw really interesting in the cross tabs, uh, with all of the campaigning he's been doing in Philadelphia, Mm -hmm. he is campaigning at 5% in the city. 5%. Yes. 5%. Dude, dude, 5%. That's going to put him over the edge right there. (laughs) I think maybe six or seven will. No, no. Six, six or seven is a landslide, man. (laughs) He gets six or 7% in Philadelphia. It's over, man. Wolf just wants to start packing his bags now. Are you serious? He's got all the way up to 5% in Philadelphia. (laughs) Yeah. I think, I think if he mows more lawns. (laughs) Yeah, right, exactly. Uh, he might be able to get some more voters out of that. I'm not yeah. sure. I think the best thing he could do is go to the west side of Philadelphia and insult some African-American people once again. I think that's going to help his numbers even more. What do you say? Yeah. He'll, he'll yeah. go and tell them to pull their pants up, right? That's what that's what he should do because that's what, that's what basically he's campaigning on. Yeah, so. <coughs> Unbelievable. So um, this poll came out like the a few days after the uh, the press club luncheon. Uh, which is a uh, monthly tradition in Harrisburg. Um, you know, people like uh, Bob Casey, Pat Toomey, Charlie Dent, uh, Eugene Dean Pasquale, Scarnati, Corman, Wolf, uh, they, pretty much like all the dignitaries of the state speak there. Katie McGinney spoke there when she was running for U.S. Senate. Uh, this is Scott Wagner's second time speaking here in the past few months. Uh, Lou Barlett has been speaking here before. And, uh, you know, uh, usually, like, these are the type of things when people are running for office, you can gauge, see if they're getting coached up by national money. You know, the same, like, happened with Katie McGinney. She came in a little disheveled when she was running in the primary. Uh, she wins the primary, and she's getting coached up by national. Uh, some of us actually thought that that was going to happen with Scott Wagner. And, uh, <laughs> and... <laughs> I'm still, I was still, you know, I'm still waiting for Bannon to come back, man. It looks like he was trying to make his way back and make a comeback. I thought he was going to show up in the state. Yeah, I haven't seen Bannon lately. But uh, so uh, the thing was a total fucking disaster for Wagner, to say the least. Did you think? <laughs> um, he came in. Uh, he started attacking Wolf on education. Uh, he was claiming that he is the only candidate uh, responsible for education. And that since Wolf has... Uh, you know, never signed a budget on time, uh, which he allowed those budgets to lapse in the law, uh, stating that because he, he didn't sign them because they didn't go far enough in funding education the first few, three years. Um, he said that the reason why uh, teachers are spending money on their own supplies and the reason why students are eating paint chips, yes, paint chips, off of their desks in some poor schools in Philadelphia, you know, which is, that, that's just the dog whistle right there. Right. Uh, is because of Governor Wolf and not going after pensions and not signing the budgets on time. Uh, so he then he, he then this goes is- on. He then like he's telling the media that they should start doing their job correctly and uh, report on the education issue because he's a true education candidate in this. And then he made it. He, he quibbed over to uh, John Bear, which uh, for those of you who well, if you listen to this, you probably know who John Bear is. He's about like five foot three, short, older guy, cr- old curmudgeon type figure. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's always wearing his black sunglasses, even in, in the Capitol when he's walking around. You really can't see what his, what his eyes are doing. And uh, he told John Bear and others to stop reporting on his jokes like Russia and the shit he says on the campaign trail and start reporting on the actual, the actual issues like education and stuff like that. Yeah, so he's basically said, look, when I say stuff, you don't report on that, right? Report on what, like, I have on my website and stuff, <laughs> right? Because every time that I speak, I say stuff that is really offensive to most people in Pennsylvania. Don't say, don't, those, don't, you don't report on that. I'm like, this yeah. is, it's unbelievable. That guy is just unreal. That guy is unreal. 
And then uh, and this is the guy of education spending, right? Who, you know, he he said he wants to spend all this money on education, but then it's like everything that he's ever advocated for has been about cutting education. So, I mean, like, even even in his language, like he said he wants to spend this money. Really, all he wants to do is just like privatize the crap out of everything. Yeah. No, he wants right. to increase education spending by a billion dollars, and then he wants to cut property taxes, and then he wants to cut. He specifically said welfare. Cut, cut the welfare programs, and then cut um, other departments to uh, to increase the education spending. There you go. Which <clears throat> you know doesn't work because uh, yeah. Um, yeah, like I mean, like yeah, pick one of the thousand reasons why that doesn't <laughs> work. Right, we can talk about that. I mean, it's just it's just spewing nonsense is what it is, and, and like the fact that you know he's like you know one of the people that was like pr- like advocating not signing uh governor wolf's budget right remember the budgets that were balanced right that increased revenue that were putting money back into schools that had a, a kind of a, a tax on natural gas extraction that was going to actually help um help balance this budget right that was all there it was something that was killed by scott wagner exactly <laughs> right <laughs> i mean there's there's the Who one basically the said that if it. scott wag if the if we pass the severance tax governor wolf's going to get reelected. right right exactly Exactly. Yeah. And so, so, so usually, so, so all this is going on. And then afterwards, uh, he has a question and answer. Uh, you know, people write their questions down and they and hand he it. He doesn't answer them. <laughs> and so he hands it, he hand, and the, the journalist uh, moderating this was Paula Knudsen from the caucus. Uh-huh. Uh, she's really good. She used to be a lawyer um, with uh, the Pennsylvania News Media Association. And so she's really good with like with sunshine policy and stuff like that. Um, she, some of the questions she asked was about um, Roe v. Wade. Why should we un- why, why should we not fund um, Planned Parenthood? And he said, "Because I'm 100 percent pro life." And these were just questions that were just like very simple questions. He was getting pissed at these questions too. Um, one of the questions he got really pissed at uh, was, uh, "Why won't you release your tax returns?" <laughs> if you recall last week that he said that he wasn't going to release his tax returns because. And then there were some higher education questions that, got, that, that were there. And um, some people like the whole entire time, people were snickering in the crowd like Jesus Christ. You could just tell by like the crowd. Like it's, it's all about like knowing your audience, like your audience is a bunch of professionals, lobbyists, uh, media people, uh, messaging gurus and shit like that. And, you know, his yeah, he, he, he just bombed. Uh, he thought he was speaking in front of a Trump rally, and he clearly wasn't. And people were kind of like, uh, "Yeah, not not. <laughs> not ready for prime time, Wagner." <laughs> so, um, you know, afterwards, so typically afterwards um, at these events, they always stick around to speak to the media, right, in a scrum. And as soon as like he was getting ready to leave, we all get our cameras ready. We go over. We we we, and he. Sort of like leaves like in this like uh, perp walk Ocean's Eleven type like heist. Like you had his daughter standing in the front, the point person, right? She was like ten feet ahead of everyone else. Then you had his spokesperson and then his campaign manager like running like a wedge block where like Wagner was like like this, <laughs> and so like and, and he just leaves bolts the stage and no one was talking to him. So, uh, you know, we're, people are asking them questions, and I, I, I was able to pepper them with some questions like, uh, excuse me, Senator Wagner, are your employees underpaid? I can't. I can't hear you. Better? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. I was like, uh, Senator Wagner, Senator Wagner, are your employees underpaid? Senator Wagner, is it because you're worried that they're going to unionize Senator Wagner? That was more like what it sounded like on it. <laughs> yes. And at one point in the audio, you hear, uh, you hear uh, Dennis Owens um, go, uh, Senator Wagner, are you taking questions? It's like, Scott, you taking any questions, Scott? It's Scott. He's like, Senator, Senator Wagner, well, former Senator Wagner. <laughs> former Senator? And you can, then you can hear Roxbury in the background laughing. <laughs> But like no, then I was like uh, one of the questions said, uh, he said I was like, "Excuse me, Senator, last week you said you don't want your place forming unions. Is that why are you don't, you're not paying them well?" And I was like, "I got like four questions out. I, I was trying to get him to the point where he was going to turn around and say something." Yeah, because you just feel the anger just radiating off of off behind him. 
Oh, it was like his back was red. You know what I mean? It was like it was like, it was like from the heat coming off. But literally, I got when the video that you posted, like you're gonna walk it out, follow him, and you said it really was. It was like you know, okay, you just got like you just fumbled the ball and you pick it up and you're running towards the end zone and you've got you like all your run around you to back and make sure no one can tackle you. <laughs> like that's what it looked like. You see these people like in suits, got to move in to block people off, block block off access. That was just that was so yeah. Much. And then like uh, you have Charlie Thompson like asking questions like in in a moderated voice like with with like the <laughs> three quarter in his face and then uh, you had you have a couple of new journalists there uh, and you have some of the trackers there obviously uh, from the different organizations but um you know as I'm like answering yelling out these questions people are just like staring at me <laughs> but I think the best part is like how he used his like his he used his uh his driver as a shield to get into the van at the end too. This is great. Like open up the door. He gets in, close the door real fast and go off and goes. The only thing that was missing from that scene, how I wish this would have happened. Like accidentally, if somebody put their hand on his head and said, watch your head as you get in. <laughs> like, <laughs> that would have been awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that didn't happen. It's like a perp walk leaving the leaving, exactly. leaving the Hilton. <laughs> exactly. And exactly. then he takes off in his Mercedes Benz uh, Sprinter van. Right, right. Go up to a uh, go up to the town hall in Pottsville, which was not a good town hall. He was really pissed. <laughs> oh man, oh man, that was just too much. And that that's my rundown much. of the press club once. That, There's that, a press club. That, that was, was my that, Monday, that, that was, was my real. Monday afternoon. <laughs> That was Monday afternoon. That was that was something else. Oh man! So I'm sure that you know Sean has once again has just decided to uh, you know make Senator Wagner feel welcome, and respected in the state of Pennsylvania, right? To get all the attention that he deserves, <laughs> because man. But uh, you know, you think uh, his employees may want to form a union after this next story? Yeah. Wagner. <clears throat> do you think? Yeah. Think. Yeah, I do think. So um, not only uh, – so Scott Wagner owns a slew of businesses, like owns a lot of different businesses. And he also – I think he's like majority owner of a second waste disposal business that no one talks about. Uh, it's called Eagle Disposal. It's out here. So basically he has Penn Waste and Eagle Disposal locking in government contracts all throughout um, you know, central, south central Pennsylvania. Um, so a um, – a trash person was struck and killed by a car uh, back in November of 2016. Uh, the, the employee was out West Lampeter Township. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, so this is with Eagle Disposal, and the thing is, the company Eagle Disposal never kept any records of injuries happening on the workplace for two whole calendar years. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Incomplete logs. And this is important because it tracks workplace hazards. It's a federal it's a federal requirement if you run a company. Right. Well here's let let's just I'm gonna read a, a section of the uh of the article for that came out from American Ledger. So just so, so here it is. So it's in November November twenty sixteen, a twenty four year old employee named Vince Nalentz, I think, on uh, Let's uh, was killed while collecting trash in West Lampeter uh, Township, PA, for Eagle Disposal. After an investigation, the U.S. Department of Labor fined the company for failing to report the death in a timely manner. Wagner, currently the Republican nominee for governor, owns 50% of Eagle Disposal. Nalens's death resulted in an investigation by the U.S. Department of Labor's Occupational Health, uh, Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, which found that Eagle Disposal violated federal labor regulations by failing to record the death within seven days of learning of the incident, according to public records obtained through a Freedom of Information request. Here's the key part. Investigative records indicated that of eight Eagle um, employees who st- sustained injuries over a two-month period in the fall of 2016, the company failed to properly maintain records of the incident uh, as mandated by federal labor law in all but one. Workplace safety advocates say mistakes like the one at Eagle Disposal put workers in danger. And that's kind of really the bigger story, right, is that you've got this person that was killed and they weren't reported in a timely manner. But it wasn't just some rando thing, right, that just happened just, oh, my God, this horrible thing happened. But there had been safety issues that have been um, that have been active at, the, at that company for a while, and none of them have been reported effectively. And this guy has been going around campaigning on gutting regulations, exactly. workplace regulations around the state. Uh, one of the things I remember, he said, it's like, do you need like a permit to put a light bulb in or do you need like a 
<clears throat> like, do you need like a workplace or do you need like this type of ladder to put a light bulb in and stuff like that? <clears throat> and that that's the type of stuff that like he's been campaigning on. Yeah, you know, and again, this is a perfect example. It's like, so why does he want to get rid of regulations? Well, because if he got rid of regulations, then this story would not be in the in the ledger because it wouldn't be illegal to not report the death of your employees, right? I mean, yeah. that's what people got to get through their head. That's what he's actually talking about. So he can do whatever he wants at whatever cost it is to his employees um, as long as he can make Boku bucks. That's it. And I think on one of the documents I've scanned through um, – he met with a um, – they met with uh, someone from the reporting agency, and he never introduced himself as a state senator, mm-hmm. just as the owner. And the guy was a little stunned at that. Interesting. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Man. So, Yeah. Well, my guess, like my guess is, is like, you know, like as we get, look, it's, it's Labor Day weekend. This is kind of an important weekend in politics, right? Because it's Labor Day weekend now. And after Labor Day is when things really start kicking up. Right. And so my, my, you know, look, there's been a lot of questions out there that we've seen like about his companies and about like, you know, the contracts with, with public entities and all this other kind of stuff. My guess is, is that, you know, these are just going to become further hampers for this guy because anything, I mean, the fact that he's, he went out and he told everybody that he doesn't want to publish his tax returns because um, if his, he doesn't want to place for a union. Right, because because if they found out, his employees found out how much he made, then they they'd be they'd be mad, right? and they would form a union, right? I mean, if that doesn't tell you already about where this guy is coming from, you know, I I, I just I, I yeah, uh, and this is not really good bode well for uh, any prospective union drives in the future. No, no. Well, for the for the employees, it does. Yeah. <laughs> just not for Wagner. Yeah, not right? for Wagner. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, so there we have it. So, you know, I think it's going to be interesting after Labor Day weekend um, that we're going to see kind of politics um, ramp up. And we're going to basically we're two weeks or two months out from um, from the elections. And um, we're going to try to be on the ground there for as much as stuff as uh, as we can. So we go. I, uh, before we go to the break and get to today's last call, I wanted to uh, give you all a little update on um you know, some of the some of the stuff that we talked about in terms of like the Chronicle Higher Education article about sick buildings at Kutztown University. Um, so uh, as you recall, last week's podcast, I told you about the article from the Chronicle of Higher Education that, um, that was featured the woman, uh, Tegan uh, Simonton. Uh, she was the she was the journalist who interviewed myself and Mike Gambone and a bunch of other um faculty members and staff members, uh, some of the KU police at, um, at Kutztown University about persistent um, uh, health hazards and in, into the buildings, right? Particularly at Lytle Hall, uh, as I kind of read last week, um, the beginning of the article tells a story about when I first it was my first time I taught summer classes at Kutztown back in like 2004 or something like this, came into the summer and there was basically mold growing on the walls, right? Um, Lytle Hall has been a persistent problem, right? And the administration hasn't agreed to fix it until we've been forcing them to fix it. Mike Gambone worked with labor and industry, bring those folks in, basically cited the university for violations of, of health codes and safety codes. And so the university was forced to fix it, right? That's the very, very short version of it. So you know, we started hearing words that, you know, of course, the was absolutely pissed. Turns out the board of trustees uh, at uh, at the university was not aware of how bad the buildings were and were kind of pissed um, that they weren't informed of this stuff earlier. Even though, look, as faculty, we and our faculty union, we've been bringing these issues forward to the administration for, for over a decade now, well over a decade. So, President Hawkinson, Kenneth Hawkinson, he gets out there on opening day um, and, you know, we have this, this opening ceremony and he has this like, you know, report on it and talks about all the money that's being spent and how it's, fake news. it's all. Uh, yeah, this is all just kind of like, you know, a bunch of whiners and complainers and blah, 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 blah. Bunch so of he, losers. I mean, Sad. Yeah, he, did, he didn't actually say that. Right. But that was kind of like you could see he was agitated being up there. So they put up these numbers about, you know, they spent basically about $2 million uh, in renovations of Lytle Hall, the building that I work in, uh, last summer. Not this just past summer, but 
a summer, you know, the summer before that, um, they, we had to get, we had to leave the building. They had to swap out all the HVAC stuff. And it's not really HVAC. It's more kind of units that are in every single office because the building is not constructed to have adequate duct duct work. So you can actually have full circulation in the building. So there's all sorts of problems, the design of the building and the materials that were used to design the building and so on. So anyway, he goes in this big thing and basically, you know, we're fixing, we're doing everything that we can to make these buildings things like happy and do all this of this past summer because of the repairs that they did the summer before the two million dollar repairs the summer before they didn't take right there was still persistent problems so this past summer they had to kind of gut um, the ceilings in the first floor and put in all these dehumidifier units and all that kind of stuff right they finished like just date and they were forced to do that from pennsylvania department of labor and industry um they just did that just like days before the beginning of the semester right and they're still not working Right. So I come into class on I come into campus on Monday, right? It's the first day of first day of classes and have to print some stuff out and things like this There's a printer down the end of the hall. And the way it works is like I was my office. I go out down the hall and there's a, a corner office that there's like a little vestibule area. Right. It used to be the department office. So that was actually an outer office and an inner office. But now that outer office um, part is uh, where the printer is. That is, you know, a faculty print from um, on, on that second floor of Lytle Hall. And so go in there and it just smells really, really musty. It smells really musty. I'm like, Man, it just smells bad in here. It's like I mean, the humidity is still bad. It, like, it was warm and all that. I go back to my office and the guy next to me says, you know, the office next to me says, did you look at the ceiling in there? And I'm like, no, don't even tell me. Yeah, go down there, took a bunch of pictures. There's black mold coming through the ceiling tiles, right? And there's this like yellow streaming. It looks like there was water that was pouring in, going over the pipes, and then dumping on the ceiling tiles and running down the wall, bringing it with this, this yellow, like these yellow water or whatever like that, that kind of like dried onto the wall. So like streams of yellow piss is what it looked like on the wall, right? And then the, the carpet stinks and all that, right? And so, like, here we go. Take the pictures. Yep, everything's fine and dandy. Black mold right here, right in the street. You could smell it from outside from um, outside the room, right? So then they come up that night. And what it looks like happened that night for the repairs, they went up. It looks like they bleached out the stuff. doesn't look like they replaced the tiles at all because you can still see where some of the stained stuff is. Um, but they bleached it out. So the next day, no, actually two days later, Wednesday, um, stopped by uh, one of my colleagues. No, it actually was yesterday, Thursday. So I stopped by one of my colleagues' office on my way out. Mike M. Bone's sitting there talking to her, and she's a faculty member who has asthma, right, uh, who's, had, who's logged some of these complaints before. And we're sitting there, and she's I hate to even ask this question, but what is that? And she points up at her ceiling, and sure enough, there's black mold growing on her ceiling's toe as well, Right. So now she's faced with the decision of like having to think about like trying to request office space someplace else across campus, right? Because they're not adequately fixing the building. So when you hear us complaining about this stuff and why is there a story in the Reading Eagle? Why is there a story um, in the Chronicle of Higher Education about Kutztown Universities and uh, building? This is why, right? And again, we recognize that we are not alone, right? That there are faculty and staff members at universities and colleges and schools across this country that are dealing with the same thing. So this is why we do what we do as faculty, as unionized faculty, is you fight this and you push this back because you got to stop this stuff. So that's my little update here. And I've got um, some nice little photographic evidence that uh, you're going to be seeing pretty soon, too, as well, now that I've got my syllabi together. Um, so, you know, because one of the unfortunately, uh, we'd love to live in a world where you kind of say, hey, look, there's this problem and you're going to work with an administration and you're going to try to get it fixed. Instead, they give you, they blow, you know, they just create the smoke and mirrors. They tell you that you're the problem, not the building. Uh, in the meantime, you got to live with black mold. So there you have it, folks. That's my happy welcome back to school week thing. So cool. All right, Sean, anything else? Uh, Pennsylvania focus? Uh, oh, oh. Oh, we had a congressional candidate from Philadelphia who showed up at the alt right rally over the last weekend, Blue Lives Matter March. It was put oh, on by God. a bunch of local anti fascists. And uh, he was upset that I, that I called him out on it. He was very mad. How dare you, Sean? How dare you? I know. <laughs> um, basically, that. So this candidate is Jewish, and they tried to um, say that I am smearing this person and his religion because he showed up to an alt right. Uh, show up to a rally as a as a concerned citizen, and like, dude. My thing is, 
if you're running for office, uh, you should know who the organizers of these events are. Yeah. And you should know what's, what you're going to. And saying you didn't know who they were is not an excuse. Uh, yeah. This organization is called Sports Beer Politics. Uh, they are holding these like anti. They're holding these like these type of events in Philadelphia, uh, so they can do what Patriot Prayer is doing out in Oregon, which is draw um, attacks, which is draw um, anti-fascist counter protesters into confrontations uh, with themselves or with um, other organizations, uh, with the, or with the police, and then on their social media pages afterwards, uh, they show themselves burning uh, anti-fascist flags that they've ripped out of the hands of protest counter protesters um this is an alt-right uh group neo-fascist group in philadelphia um and some local republicans have been showing up to it and it just shows you that this is the future of the party no and this is what it is this is stuff that these these folks have been uh toiling with you know have been playing around with for a long time they like to be able to claim they can distance themselves from this stuff but come on Especially in today's day and age, right? Uh, you know that you got to watch what's going on. Um, and there's so, no, and, well, there's not even. Let, let me put it this way: Let's say, let let's say that the, the, it was a genuine, it was a genuine mistake on this guy's part, right? Then the way that you respond to that tells you everything, right? If you said that, is that you? Know, oh my God, I had no idea. I, I can't believe. Thank you for telling me this. I want all my constituents to know that had I known, I should have done my due diligence on this, but I did not. I thought this was something supportive of the pre- police. I didn't, you know, um, we will never make sure we denounce them. Um, we do not want to kind of support any of these um, of these kind of these right wing kind of hate groups um, right here. Right. You come out, you take full ownership of that. You say it's a mistake and then you disown those people. But that is not what happened. Was it, Sean? <laughs> <laughs> no, it is not. I, I still did not watch this guy's video that he posted in response me calling him out on Twitter. But um, the things that's been happening lately is that uh, the Pennsylvania GOP has been going after Democrats uh, because of the DSA candidates that have running. And he said, you got to take ownership of this. So I pretty much made a shit post in response saying, hey, the, Re- the Republican Party enjoys retweeting this guy all the time. But he showed up to an event with neo-fascists and white supremacists. You have to own this. What do you have to say for yourself? <laughs> Yeah, please retweet. <laughs> and a couple of consultants, a Harrisburg-based consultant um, who represents the Catholic Church. Uh, yeah, just go, <laughs> of all places. Put that in the same barrel for you. There you um, go. Basically said this is a smear job. This guy's Jewish. And he, this guy tried to use his religion, his ethnicity, saying like he, he was just showing up to. But there's a video of him clearly thanking the people who organized this event. And these go. people are involved with the Philadelphia, the anti-fascist crowd in Philadelphia, and these people in Philadelphia who lit, are based out of the city include uh, members of Identity Europa, the, the Fraternal Order of Alt Knights, people involved with Charlottesville, and stuff like that. We're not talking about far-right organizers. We're talking about neo-fascists, neo-fascists, and proto-fascists out there. Yeah. Period. So, right. <laughs> right there. So there you have it. So, uh, you know, you make your bed, folks. You make your bed. Like, these were the people who were sharing Pinochet memes and shit like that. Yeah. Like, who who want to throw anti-fascists and liberals out of helicopters. Like, these are the type of people. This is the reality that they are living in. Pinochet did nothing wrong. (laughs) Right? That's a t-shirt. Oh, boy. Well, all right, folks. Uh, We're going to kind of uh, move into today's last call. Got some stuff from Free Will. Got some space news back for you this week. And uh, Sean's going to tell us uh, about what is the best sandwich in Philadelphia. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. We'll be back right after this break. This is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. For the past seven years, Raging Chicken Press has brought pull-no-punches, progressive reporting and commentary to the interwebs. Our long-form investigative pieces, stories that no access journalist wants to touch, or rollicking weekly podcasts strive to advance progressive movements and perspectives rooted in the struggles happening across the country or down the street. We've broken national stories and caused our share of discomfort in the halls of power. If we want a progressive future, we need progressive media. And you can help support Pull No Punches, homegrown progressive media today. 
Become a member of Raging Chicken Press for as little as $5 a month. Simply go to patreon.com slash rcpress and choose your membership level. We need to make sure to keep the movement in the media and the media in the movement. Best way you can do that is to become a member of Raging Chicken today by going to patreon.com slash rcpress. Thank you for your energy, your encouragement, and your support. Keep up the fight. Welcome back to Raging Chickens Out to Coop podcast. It's the last call. Eh, we got space news. We got beer and whatever else we feel like throwing in for a little fun way to close out the program. I've uh, got a few things in space news this week. Um, yes, indeed. You may have heard us talk a little bit about this before. I should say heard me talk a little bit about this before. This is Sean's, you know, we call it Sean's tweet time now. Um, so um, NASA wants uh, basically, these, according to new NASA administrator, uh, you know, Trump appointed uh, Jim Bryanstein, wants to make sure that we got lots of people in space. They say that we basically, there's a gap that has opened up that we haven't had a lot of people out in space. We need to get more people out in space. And so that's what they're going to do. Um, they're going whole hog, it looks like, on the moon. So um, Amazon has been in on this one too as well. Jeff Bezos is uh, his Blue Origin rockets systems and all this. They're really targeting the moon as um, as kind of like doing that moon base thing. Looks like Jim Bridenstine is going to um, team up with good old Mike Pence and um, get people on the moon. We'll see if this is uh, how much of this is a ploy and how much they're actually going to put money behind it. But it sounds like they're willing to commit money to these projects. So. You're going to see see more of this stuff, and you're going to see an increase in privatization um, of these, uh, you know, space exploration. So keep an eye on that. As for I know I will. Um, you may have heard us talk before too, as well. Um, Opportunity rover um, out there on Mars that shut down back in June, shortly after June, because there's been this enormous dust storm. This happens periodically on Mars every every few years, where the entire planet just gets hazy, right? So if you're looking at it through a telescope, the whole planet becomes hazy because there's these global uh, dust storms that cover everything. And the dust storms on Mars, they have these little things called fines so that the, the particles are super, super fine and can kind of tear stuff up and everything. Uh, what happened with Opportunity, Opportunity Rover, of course, um, is powered primarily um, through solar panels, right? Obviously, if the, everything, the sun is covered, you're not going to have solar panels. So it went into a um, kind of a hibernating state, kind of closed up and things like this, um, went into low power mode, so on. So uh, this week, the dust storm has begun to subside, and there's been some places where the sun has been peeking through. Um, so we've got a few days. They've been sending pings out the opportunity rover. See, so it's going to wake it up. Not they have not had a response yet. Um, so we'll see. We'll see if it's going to kick back up. It, this has been just kind of one of those historic moments, really, with this with this rover. I mean, um, the opportunity rover it went up there and it had like a, a twin, which is called Spirit, um, and they were designed for like ninety a ninety day mission. Right, um, they thought they could last about ninety days. Maybe, maybe they're going to get um, maybe up to a year out of these things. Um, but you know, opportunity uh, spirit kind of crapped out earlier on. But um, but the opportunity has been there now for fifteen years. Um, has kind of explored more than twenty eight miles of the Martian surface um, and sent back incredible, incredible data. So you know. Um, I've got my fingers crossed that they're going to be able to wake this thing up, but you know, it's going to be tough. They're saying that once you hit um, cold temperatures, especially when the sun closes out, not only do you lose battery power and um, the other little um, energy element that's in there that usually heats up some of the components that can go dark and it gets so cold that some of the little tubes and stuff in the, in the circuits can snap and break and pop. So we'll see. And they said that if they don't hear from it soon, I think about 45 days. Um, and then after they still don't get the response, they're going to say, see ya, opportunity, see ya, right? Um, and I have to say, uh, Opportunity Rover, by the way, right? And why I want to celebrate Opportunity Rover, because the Opportunity Rover did not pick Sarah Palin as its running mate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, last thing, this week too as well, I, you know, this is a, kind of a first. The uh, International Space Station actually sprung a leak. They started, um, uh, air pressure started slowly dropping, like in the modules, they finally tracked it down. 
into, I think it was the Russian module, right? Um, collusion, man. It was collusion that did it. Now, I was into the Russian module, and they find they found a small hole. I think it was they said it was like a two millimeter hole or something like this, and they patched it with this special tape that they did special um, um, temporary patch to it. And now they're gonna have to do a, a kind of a more complex patch. But what was why I kind of bring this up now is like not only is this the first time something like this has happened where they've actually had a puncture of a system from something and in order to kind of put a hole in it, it's either, I mean, there's the possibility that there was a, a crack just because of the aging of the, of the module, but they're thinking most likely that is this had come from being hit by a kind of a micro meteorite or a lot of the space junk that is out there. Um, so we'll see. George Takai, who's the you know guy who plays Sulo on Star Trek, um, the George Takai actually um, was pushing out this video a couple months ago. Now that had this uh, this graphic image and this display of the amount of actually space junk that is floating around uh, floating around our planet, and it's pretty disturbing actually when you start looking at it. Um, so we're, we're at this point now where we may actually start seeing the um you know the inevitable result of putting a bunch of junk up there it's going to start running into each other um and now you've got actually people up there so we'll see what happens um i i unfortunately today if you might have heard that my my voice is a little different than normal i'm i'm talking from a headset today on my laptop because my my son had a sleepover and they're playing games and it's loud and i'm just going to tell them I'm not going to tell them to be quiet for that time so i'm doing it from my laptop um so i don't have my soundboard with me because i had some i have some great sound that i've got teed up um that uh for sean uh we're going to talk a little about star trek but we're gonna have to put that off until next week and um and then and, and then you'll see why so that's what I got for space news this week, Sean. So um, just, 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 uh, I'm just going to hit my button now. Let Sean know it's okay to wake up. Okay. <laughs> Welcome back, Sean. <laughs> oh, he's still sleeping. <laughs> All right. I just want to um, – a couple two cool things. Free Will had two can releases this week, everybody. Two can releases. Um, the first one that came out um, on Thursday was uh, Scarecrow. Right um, now, this is not for everybody. I know this is not for Sean. Um, Sean is not a fan of the uh, uh, the autumn spice stuff. But um, this is the first time that Scarecrow has actually been put in cans. All right, it's on draft. So if you want to go and get some stuff on draft, you want to get a growler, that's great. Um, but they also have it in four pack, uh, four pack cans, sixteen ounce cans. And it is an autumn spiced ale, um, and it's just here for uh, perfect for Labor Day. Uh, it's brewed with vanilla, allspice, nutmeg, and cinnamon. And I say the beer is as dreaming of those glorious fall days when wearing our famous flannel, blah, 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 blah. Um, but I really like this stuff, um, so check it out if that's your thing. The other one, which comes out tomorrow. But you're going to pick me up this. Which, what's that? The pepperoni. Oh, I thought you were like, oh, man, I'm not going to have that. I don't like I was just looking at it. (laughs) It looks good, right? Yeah, so Sabatini's, if you want to go, I'll I'll, I'll explain that to you real quick. But if you want to go ahead with... uh... No, I was going to say, the the can release comes out tomorrow. It's a cloudy with a chance of pepperoni. It's a New England-style IPA, right? Um, And here's the story that they've got on here. Then I'll turn it over to Sean. It says, a few weeks ago, our friends from Sabatini's Bottle Shop and Bar in Exeter, PA, paid us a visit to collaborate on a beer for their month-long anniversary celebration in September. They brought pizza. We brewed a beer and added a little of this, a little of that, and bada-bing, (laughs) bada-boom. Cloudy with a chance that pepperoni was born. So it's a New England style IPA with oats, milk, sugar, uh, sugar and despite the name, does not actually contain pepperoni. <laughs> right. So, so, um, so Sabatini's is a bottle shop and bar- pizza place up in, uh, up in the Scranton Wilkes Barre area. Mm-hmm. And every so they always have uh, people doing collaborations for them. So Pizza Boy did a collaboration with them recently. Free Will's done a couple. But it's always like pizza name themed beers that, you're, like, that they only brew for that place. Yeah. And um, I, have not, I have never been there. But if you're ever in the scranton wilkes Bear area, you got to go to Sabatini's. Uh, it's like one of the largest bottle shops on the East Coast, pretty much. Awesome. 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 Crazy sours and stuff like that. Belgian beers from uh, Europe and stuff like that too. Well, I'm up that way quite a bit. So I'm going to make a, I'm going to carve that out um, next time, next time that I'm up there. I was actually supposed to be up that way this weekend, but um, it's not happening. It's not happening. So um, there, so cloudy with a chance of pepperoni. Um, that's out there. Free will too, as well. I'm going to try to pick up that. I'm going to try to pick up scarecrow. Um, that's cool. 
And, oh, the last update on the Bitter Buddha. If you remember last week where I said I had bought it, but I had not had it yet. Um, Bitter Buddha, it's a contemporary goze ale with passion fruit, hibiscus, and sea salt. And uh, I'd never had it before. Or, yeah, I'd never had it before. And so it was the first time I cracked it open. Oh, man, it's good. It's definitely good. Um, I, I, they still had some over there. I just went by to pick up some more. They also have freshy cans um, that are that are out. Uh, th- that's great too as well. But Bitter Buddha was a standout. So um, check that out if you can. Some great kind of bomber bottles here that I don't feel like going up and bringing in. Maybe I'll talk about it next week. Haven't opened them yet. They're sitting there. Um, Sean, have you ever had the Blue Farm? Actually, now that I think about it, I had. I had. I love that. I thought it was good. Yeah, I had that. I had that last week, and it's it's great. I loved I, I loved it last year, and this year I think I liked it more. I don't know if it's if it's if the recipe has changed any kind of substantially, but I just uh, this year it really hit the spot um, right at the right time. Nice fresh beer, um, farmhouse ale, good stuff. Cool. So you are heading back this way for Labor Day, I take it. Yes, I'm leaving right after this podcast. Uh, tomorrow I will be in South Philly visiting my aunt, uh, me, my mom, my niece are going to go down. And I am going to be getting uh, a roast pork sandwich from John's Roast Pork in South Philly. All right. Everybody hear this now. Get your, uh, get your game on, Philly. So, <laughs> like, the cheesesteak is the sandwich that people, the Philadelphia is known for. Mm-hmm. But it's the roast pork that is the best sandwich to come out of Philadelphia. Uh, it's, You're staking it, your reputation on this? Yes, I am. All right. Um, it's, it's a, it's a roast pork sandwich. Usually they have like the stuff sitting in broth for like over a day or so. It's some different places. Everyone has like their own, uh, broth recipe. Like they're, uh, usually it's broccoli rob. I usually go with spinach, mm-hmm. uh, broccoli rob or spinach, extra sharp provolone cheese and the roast pork on like a homemade, uh, sarcones roll. <laughs> Dude, and, my mouth is watering already as you're talking about it. <laughs> yeah, it's... <laughs> It's just a lot. It, it's like the, the cheesesteak's pretty basic. This is like for people who like to eat pork. Well, that's not a thing for some people, but I am a huge, I love pork. Mm-hmm. This is just awesome. Uh, it's an Italian. It's, it, it's the best sandwich of Philadelphia. And it's, it's underrated. It's completely underrated. It lives in the shadow of the cheesesteak, but it's better. <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. So everybody, like get your head out of the cheesesteak bowl, <laughs> right? Out of that world. Get yourself some roast pork. So, uh, cool. Anything else for the good of the order, Sean? Uh, nope. I am all good. Yeah, he's looking ready to go. So, Sean, hey, man, drive safe today. Um, safe travels. And I hope to see you on Monday, um, at least for a little bit. I um, hope we can coordinate that. And I've got uh, the beer that I've been saving for you. And then uh, if I can get over there today. Well, I'll get over there one time this weekend um, to pick you up a little surprise, surprise. For well, the beer comes out tomorrow. Well, the pepperoni does tomorrow. Yeah, yeah that's right. But I'm going to go over there today anyways. <laughs> I mean, come on. I got to space it out. <laughs> I got to give myself a reason. <laughs> All right, man. Well, safe travels. Uh, happy Labor Day, and I'll, I'll see you in a few. All right. I'll catch you later. All right, man. Take it easy. This right. is Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken Press. Thanks for tuning in. I want to remind you to become a member of Raging Chicken. You just go to patreon.com slash RC Press today. Become a member for as little as five bucks a month. We appreciate all that you've done to support us, whether it's oh, supporting us by becoming a member, by giving us a one-time donation, by tweeting and stuff. Um, everything that you do, um, thank you. So Kevin Mahoney, editor and founder of Raging Chicken, signing out. Until next week, see ya!